so for our next session, uh, which we're going to start in a minute, uh, it's really an honor for me and a privilege to present the, the next, uh, well, it's going to be a fireside chat. It's going to be super interesting. Um, with Mary Grove, who is the director for Google for Entrepreneurs, which I had the privilege of being a part of the team when I first joined Google. Uh, Mary Grove is, as, as, as I said, she's the director of Google for Entrepreneurs. She's leading Google's efforts to support startups and entrepreneurs in more than 100 countries around the world. Uh, Mary is passionate about building community and has worked with groups of entrepreneurs in Pakistan, Iraq, Gaza, and Afghanistan, and previously led numerous international partnerships for Google. Uh, Mary earned her BA and MA from Stanford University, and she is the co-founder of Silicon Valley, uh, Valley uh, North Stars, Silicon North Stars, a nonprofit that connects youth from the Midwest to Silicon Valley. Uh, she has served on the board of the Techstars Foundation, UP Global, and the Stan Stanford Alumni Association. So please welcome Mary Grove. I'd like to um, invite Monica Walsh, who is on my team. She's the head of communications and PR for Google Launchpad, where uh, she's helping uh, to grow and scale Launchpad's research, ensuring startups globally have um, access to resources and technology to be successful. So welcome, Monica. Thank you so much, Jerry, for that kind introduction. Thank you. Hello. Can everybody hear? Um, thank you, Sherry, and thanks for hosting this amazing gathering of female founders. Sherry is, um, you know, really the architect behind this. It happens twice a year here at, uh, at the Launchpad space. So thank you, Sherry, for your vision and tenacity for making this happen for all of us. Hello again. Hello, dear friend. <laughs> We had lunch yesterday, and today we get to um, share some things publicly. We'll keep some things from our lunch, um, you know, in, internal to just you and I. But I'm really excited that I get to talk to you now and, and share a bit of you uh, with all these wonderful people. You ready? Thank you so much for hosting. It's really a privilege to be here and see so much amazing talent in one room. I apologize, I just got back from Brazil a little bit ago where I lost my voice, so we will try to um, bring it back. All right. Um, so, Mary, you kind of drew the lucky straw when it comes to career development and growth. You're Stanford through and through, undergrad, MBA, and you went right from there to Google uh, in 2004 where you helped work um, on the IPO that Google was going through at the time. Uh, what was that like? Let's sort of talk a little bit about the early days and share, you know, some of what that was like for you. Thanks, Monica. I absolutely agree that I drew the lucky straw in life in a lot of things. But um, my story began actually, just to back up a bit, my parents were both immigrants from Thailand who came separately, met here. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. They started and ran numerous businesses together for over 30 years. And I grew up with this notion of really inspired by the American dream. People who came from absolute rural poverty came here in search of opportunity and the idea that with entrepreneurship, with hustle, with hard work, you could make that happen. So that was a, a very important ethic sort of from, from the beginning. When I ended up here in Silicon Valley, it was to go to, to college and I had no idea how I would afford it or make it work or where that would lead. And so I actually, I studied international policy, uh, women's issues, it's always my passion, international development public policy. I did not think that I'd end up working in tech. What I missed was the fact that technology could be this incredible enabler to address all those issues so rapidly. And it did happen for you to see your point. I was on my way to law school and thought I would work in somewhere in the legal profession for a year or two. So I did join Google in 2004 as a legal assistant. And I got to work on the IPO. I knew nothing about public offerings or corporate securities or even tech for that matter. But uh, Google took a big gamble on me. David Drummond hired me at the time. He was responsible for all of the business areas in our legal team as well. So it was um, an incredible learning experience where I learned that if you have a passion, an aptitude, a willingness, a drive, a desire to work hard and learn, you really can um, have an impact. And I was fortunate then to join a team called New Business Development led by Megan Smith, who you may know, a very inspirational woman, was our first female CTO. 
at the White House in the previous administration. Huge mentor to me. And then six years ago, we had the opportunity again to start a new team within Google, which is currently Google for Entrepreneurs, and we can chat more about that. Wow, amazing. I actually um, learned something new because I, I didn't um, realize that women's studies was a, a part of your background. And um, I almost went to law school too. <laughs> um, so if we look at what you've done at Google, you sort of alluded to the Google for Entrepreneurs. You're kind of a startup girl at heart. Um, Google for Entrepreneurs started, I guess, almost seven years ago now. You, uh, you started it um, uh, along with the team, I, I know, because uh, it takes a team. And, um, and now it's uh, in a, over 125 countries or something like that. That's a pretty big footprint uh, for Google. So tell us a little bit about GFB, about Google for Entrepreneurs. What was the inspiration behind it? What continues to drive it? And I'll stop there. Great. Well, it absolutely is a total team effort, but the genesis behind Google for Entrepreneurs is the story, the kernel of, of the idea, of course, started 20 years ago when we were a startup founded in a garage by Larry and Sergey, our founders. And ultimately, at, at its heart, Google is very entrepreneurial, right? We were founded by two entrepreneurs, we're run by entrepreneurial people. We have a great passion for giving back, for empowering the next generation, and that's something you'll find through and through in any Googler who you meet. And so seven years ago, when I, I just had moved back to Mountain View, I spent five years in New York and Zurich, which is our engineering headquarters for Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and I was working on emerging markets. And as part of that work, we were working on access, how do we help create more access, connectivity, how do we get more content online from these regions, and thirdly, how do we, what's, what's the entrepreneurship like? How do we help fuel the ecosystem of students, developers, accelerators, startups? And moving back to Mountain View, we learned that Google had just launched Google Ventures, as it was then known, now it's known as GV, which is our investment fund focused on financial return, direct investment in startups in the US only at the time. And so our founders and our leadership team said, what about everything else Google is and can and should be doing to support startups before they're ready to receive direct investing. And it wasn't that the work was fundamentally new. The team I was on previously, as well as many other teams, have been doing great work to support startups. The idea was it was all very organic and ad hoc, and we would sort of scrap for resources, and we thought, what if we just launched a dedicated team with headcount and budget to go proactively do this work? And so that was how, how we began, and it was a pilot experiment with a team of one, which very quickly grew, and I owe the team a tremendous debt for everything that they um, have built. And today we're 30, 32 people in eight countries on the ground, scanning 17 time zones, but our work is, is seen and felt in 140 countries. And the way we do that is in, in two ways. The first is around physical spaces, and we know that in our very hyper-connected online world, nothing can replace what's happening here today. Right? Nothing can replace the importance of convening offline in community. In community. So we run a network of seven campuses across the world. They're all outside the US. So Campus London, Tel Aviv, Madrid, Warsaw, Seoul, Sao Paulo, where I just was, and our seventh is in Berlin launching next year. And that's part one, is, is these physical community spaces where they're totally free to open. We have co-working, cafe, a residency program for startups to actually be based there and receive education from Google. We bring in hundreds of Googlers as office hour coaches, mentors, and that's part one. Part two, though, the way we get to 140 countries is through partnerships. And fundamentally, we believe that, you know, they say, you want to go fast, go alone, you want to go far, go together. We partner with over 50 organizations globally who we believe are the leading groups supporting entrepreneurs, whether that's groups like Startup Grind, Techstars, Astia, groups who are, who are both creating physical spaces, creating educational plays, creating resources to help connect you with capital. And we back these organizations financially. We don't take equity in them. We help their operational budget, unrestricted resources, which is a very rare thing in this environment. And we try to help them scale their footprint. We give them access to Google technology, our, um, our talent. So within that network, we have 50 partners. We've helped them scale. For example, Startup Weekend started with us. They were in 20 countries, and so they're in 125. So being able to sort of be a funder, a supporter, a catalyst for that work. But I would be remiss not to mention the multiple other teams at Google who do amazing work to support startups and developers like your team and 
the Curie team. Um, so one of our jobs is to help also just communicate across Google and make sure that we're, for you as an entrepreneur, as a founder, how do we make it as easy as possible for you to access our very large organization and help you get the tools you need to be successful. So I have a lot of follow-up to what you just un unfurled because there's a lot in what you just said. So speaking a little bit to the footprint that Google has globally, what what trends are you seeing um, in the entrepreneurship world, in the tech world globally, that we ought to be paying attention to here in San Francisco, here in Silicon Valley, as we begin to sort of spin up our own ideas? It's a great question. There's there are a lot of different trends that we observe around the world. One is that you know we know the tipping point is here. We talk a lot about mobile, and especially we spend a lot of time in emerging markets. We know that tipping point is here. The interesting stat is that by the year 2020, 90% of people over the age of six will have a mobile phone or have access to one. So the market has arrived, right? Earlier at Google in the industry, we used to talk about making your products compatible with mobile. So you build a product, and then you, there's a team that would make it optimized for mobile. And then we talked about mobile first. And often now we're talking about mobile only. And these, these industries that are just leapfrogging. So I think that's one ultimate trend that we're, we're tracking. The second, and there's great work happening you know, right here as we speak, is around the importance of the, the unbelievable potential of machine learning and artificial intelligence we're seeing globally. And the speed at which that's happening is really beyond what we ever could have estimated one or two or three years ago. So, we're seeing a lot more education programs, products like TensorFlow that are trying to make it easier for everyone to have access to these amazing computing platforms. That's the second. And third, I would say going global, internationalizing, looking beyond your market is probably the number one piece of advice that I personally give startups. Is if your market is, if you're in France and your market's 80 million people, that seems pretty large, but really it's nowhere near large enough. So, how can we launch global, internationalize from day one or as early as possible? And with Google for Entrepreneurs, that's actually our, our number one goal and I think value proposition is because we are a global company, because we have this infrastructure, we can help you with that. So I mentioned the partner network as well as our campus network. We have something called the Google for Entrepreneurs Global Passport. So if, for example, you're an entrepreneur based on any of our campuses, any of our 25 partner spaces, when you're on the road, you can work for free from any of those 35 spaces around the world. And we have entrepreneurs taking advantage of this every week, whether it's, I want to enter the mobile market in Korea, I'm going to plop down in, in Seoul and work for two weeks, I want to enter uh, Europe via Dublin, I'm going to work from job patch labs. And so a lot of these, these trends we're seeing, I'm excited to see where they go. So how many people from the audience are from outside the United States? Shout out countries. China. France. Okay, of those countries that you heard, Mary, are there partnerships and campuses? Every single one of them but Ukraine. I'm sorry, we'll add it to the list. <laughs> but our partners, Startup Grind and Startup Weekend, I believe, are active there. So that's one of our ways of understanding the market is by partnering with great organizations who are already there, and then we, we understand more. And often that can lead to us building a campus as well. Korea is a great example where we had three years of partnerships under our belt, understanding the market, and figured, found out, wow, this is a massive opportunity, must be there. Other places, though, strategically, we find there are incredible partners who are doing the work there, and our best bet is actually to back them. That's our approach in the U.S. You may ask, what about the U.S.? We have nine tech hub partners across North America. Our strategy is actually to deprioritize Silicon Valley, not because we don't care about it, but we're here, and there's a lot of density of things happening. We would rather shine a spotlight with our resources on Nashville, Detroit, Durham, Minneapolis, Chicago, Denver, you name it. These are the cities who are actively in our network, and I've spent a lot of time on the road, been lucky to spend time in all of these cities, and it's unbelievable what's happening. It's just that the, the tech press is yet yeah, they're shining a spotlight. We feel like that's part of our role that we can play. And part of your role. So everyone who raised their hand, get your global passport. <laughs> um, wonderful. So tell us um, a little bit about the opportunity for Google when you go into these partnerships and you decide um, to start a campus uh, in Tel Aviv or, um, you know, in Madrid, um, 
what's the benefit for Google? What does Google get out of it? You know, I think one of my favorite things about getting to do this work within Google is the motivation behind it and where we sit. So it's a rare privilege to be in a company where we have at this point invested over $100 million of Google's money into communities without direct financial return. Right? We are not, we roll into the direct business function and leadership of Google, so we're not a sales arm, we're not a product distribution arm, we're not trying to acquire your company, but it really is coming out of Google's bottom line. And the reason behind that is not philanthropic either. It's that we believe that investing in these communities long term is also good for our bottom line long term. So it's, it, you know, bears to stand that the more companies who are created, startups launch, come online, use the internet, use Google products, it's also going to help our revenue as well, but it's a long term investment. And I feel privileged to not have that pressure, but we also are constantly trying to deliver value back to make sure we get to keep growing this work. And so what's in it for us are the things that I mentioned. We, we make it 100%. It will never be a requirement for startups in our campuses or our programs or our partnerships to use Google products. But one of the top three pieces of feedback we get is, can you please help me understand how to get access or trade on it? So being a conduit for that, we work very closely with the cloud team, for example. We help distribute free credits if you are looking to choose the platform. How do we make it as easy and as cost effective as possible? A second thing is it helps our, our core business. We expand into new markets constantly, and we, we understand the community better. We understand where our products and services are needed locally. And um, a third benefit is I think it helps us also be closer to you know the rest of the ecosystem. For example, we spend a lot of time with the public policy team. And we together spend a lot of time advocating governments for policies that are friendly towards tech companies, which also are friendly towards entrepreneurs, right? Regulatory environment is really an important ingredient of whether an ecosystem can thrive. And how easy is it to start a company? Similarly, how easy is it to shut it down? Are there any incentives we can create for entrepreneurs like yourselves who are taking risks using their own capital? Are there are tax incentives. So we spend a lot of time thinking about this. And it's another benefit of the work is that we understand directly from the user. So with, with that, um, speak a little bit about the economic drivers, you know, that Google might look for um, in, in any sort of given geographic location. Great question. I think a lot of this work, people ask, how do you measure success? How do you measure, how do you know if this is working, this is worth continued investment? So the two metrics that I'm most interested in, and we track a lot more than this, but it's jobs created and funding raised by startups who we support, both directly in our campuses and through our partner network. So I can tell you today that, that as of today, startups, we have 400,000 entrepreneurs in our, in our network, both directly and through partners. They collectively have raised $3.9 billion and they've created 40,000 new jobs. And a new job, is, as you know directly, is it's really a hard thing to create. So we're really proud of that work, but it's real economic development in these markets, and that's probably the number one metric. But we do track what's the survival rate of these companies, we track closely what are the sources of funding, how do we help unlock more capital in these markets. We aren't directly investing, but we do a lot in the form of demo days, in the form of investor office hours, introductions. But beyond that, we also care about the, the reach. Um, but I would say the impact numbers are the most interesting. I know uh, you you don't want to use the word philanthropy. I come from a background of uh, philanthropy and um, and politics, and so I I understand at the policy level and certainly at the political level how important this play is uh, for Google. So maybe we can uh, we can call it the, something like strategic social impact. Um, in, for the benefit of right. like, technology and economic growth in I this think, region. I think there's nothing, I certainly have nothing against philanthropy. It has a huge, very important role, and I, we work very closely with our Google.org team, for example. We just don't, but we also, on the partnership side, we don't discriminate between working with nonprofits or for profits. So I'd say about 40% of our partner organizations happen to be nonprofit by status. And usually they do that because they want multiple, they want to diversify sources of funding for them, right? But we don't treat it like a, it's not a charitable grant when it comes from Google, it's a sponsorship commercial agreement. So I absolutely think that it is social impact in one way. It's not philanthropy in the traditional sense, but it's, um, I do embrace that concept. I think we, we have a huge for it. Yeah, it's really inspiring to kind of see the whole picture that um, Google is trying to 
campaigns around its support for start startups and, and entrepreneurs globally. Um, GFV, although it's not branded as such, just launched uh, a site. Do you want to tell everyone about it? Yes. So we know that as a startup, as an entrepreneur, it's difficult to navigate Google. Right? There's probably 20 plus teams that you want to access. We understand this because internally we have trouble sometimes coordinating amongst ourselves. And so we recently in September launched as a very collective cross Google effort, the beginning of what we hope can be a helpful resource. So it's called Startup with Google. It's a website, it's startup.google.com. And the goal is for this to be a single destination where you as an entrepreneur can access resources and have a proper navigation system to navigate what. So it's, you know, I'm interested in, in looking at a technology stack. I'm interested in getting funding in my market. I'm interested in connecting locally with my community. We help you navigate through. So we worked with probably 25 different teams. This is a, humbly I must offer, this is the version one. So we want to keep, keep building on it, keep adding to it. But this is our goal of helping make it easier for the end user to navigate Google. Because um, I know it's a challenge today. Yeah, so it's a, that's a great first step. Thanks for, for that initiative. Um, we're going to pivot a little bit from Google for Entrepreneurs. And um, just so that the audience knows, we will um, give some time for you guys to ask questions. So you can start thinking um, if you have questions of your own. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute. So. Uh, we're all women here, um, or we identify ourselves as women, or we're allies to women and women's initiatives. And I know that's something you care deeply about, um, equity, inclusion, and you've uh, integrated that into almost everything that you've done from the start of your education and, and career. So speak to us a little bit about uh, where you're putting your energy in, in that regard and and how it's impacting the countries that GFV is serving. It's a great question. You know, it's from the time we started GFV, we, we thought about diversity, inclusion, and equity as a top three priority for the team every single year. That's never changed. That won't change until the state of our industry and community has changed as well. But our approach is we just want to make it a horizontal layer across everything we do and have it fundamentally a part of the DNA and have it be a part of how we measure our own success. So from a diversity and inclusion perspective, I look across our work. Um, from a campus perspective, we're trying really hard to get to 50% female membership across the board. Right now we're at 38% globally. We still have more work to do. We'd like to get to 50% of female participation within the programs we run, which we have direct control over, of course. And another way we do that is, is trying to create um, programs specifically for underrepresented communities to come in. So within our campus, we pilot an accelerator called Campus for Moms. Traditional accelerators, we know they're usually three months, 24-7, very immersive. These are 10 weeks. It's one day per week of curriculum. You bring your babies and children with you. We have crying rooms, playrooms, feeding rooms. We build this together. We run this in all six campuses around the world numerous times. We've seen numerous companies launch and sustain. And what's even more joyful is the community, the alumni community that forms as a result. So that's one example within the campus of how we're thinking about it. But other forms of underrepresented as well, not just not just um, female founders or women in tech. So Applicable is, the, is a program at our campus in Tel Aviv where we try to help startups make their products um, accessible for those with visual impairments from day one. And so that's an example of how to help companies who have the right intentions but don't have the right resources make these tweaks very quickly. On the partnership side, our commitment is to spend 20% of our budget towards diversity initiatives. And this isn't to say we're just targeting organizations focused on diversity, which we are as well. But across the network, which is where we're going to have the most impact. Everyone has incremental change. It's going to be a huge sea of change. So we are, um, as a community, we ran a pilot, for example, three years ago, which we learned so much from, called 40 Forward. At the time, we had 40 partners, is, is why the name. And we put out a challenge to our partners and said, we'll, we will fund additional efforts. Please submit proposals. We as a network, we want to increase representation of women in our events, in our communities, in our, as our membership, in our portfolios by 10% over the next year. We didn't quite get there. We got to 7%, but we got so many learnings. And that's the simple thing as tweak the time of day from events to not just be happy hours and dinners all the time, to by simply announcing one organization 1871 in Chicago 
announced a female focused accelerator. They hadn't even had a chance to launch it yet, which they eventually did. Just by announcing it, they saw a spike of 25% membership of signed up to their general space. So it's declaring we're a place that's welcome for women. In Gaza, they learned that the social norm there was that there wasn't a respect for working outside the home for women um, unless it was paid work. So they actually paid women who went to their accelerator just a small stipend. But it changed the balance, and they're now over 50% female membership in the accelerator program. So lots of little learnings that we published, disseminate, try to share. Um, so we're, it's a work in progress every single day, but I would say fundamentally it has to be part of our DNA. For our team, specifically our actual team, is two-thirds women. We have had um, three, three to four maternity leaves a year on a small team of uh, 30 people. Yours truly just came back five months ago. So it's figuring out as well the team, our actual team, and hiring and processing. How do we support each other? How do we make it not just okay, but celebrate and encourage to have multiple facets of your life integrated? So definitely a, a very humble work in progress, and we'd love to hear continued suggestions for more than you do. I, I love how you're taking down barriers and um, you know really paying attention to cultural nuances and how you do that in each of the regions uh, and countries that, that you serve. Um, very, very inspiring. So you mentioned you're just back from maternity leave. Um, you shared with me over lunch your twins um, are going to be one next month and you're busy planning birthday party. Um, and I'm just curious uh, if you'd like to share in the audience, you're, you're very driven. You've had an incredibly successful career. How are you balancing it now with twins? What have been some of the challenges, and have you changed perspective now? It is an incredible joy. It's an incredible delight and honor and privilege. It's something that I've, I've dreamt of my whole life. It's also shockingly and phenomenally and unbelievably hard. <laughs> right? And so on any given night, I may sleep eight hours or one hour, and the next day is whatever it was going to be regardless. Right? And I know so many of you in the room can, can relate. I'm the newbie here. So I'm taking any and all advice. But uh, it's definitely been a huge learning experience and I think they're, I'm gonna throw the word balance out the door because it, I think it's also about figuring out what's the new me, what's the new prioritization, what's the new, how do I integrate all those components in my life. I think the number one thing that I've learned is just being, being as honest and upfront as I can with my team, with my colleagues, with my family, with everyone in my life about where I am and what I need to do. Right, my role obviously is a very global one. Prior to having my kids, I travel constantly, and then that kind of had to slow down when I was pregnant with twins. And then coming back, I, and I told my my team, this isn't going to be forever. But ask, please ask for your understanding. I just took my first international trip last week, so I, I waited a few months, just trying not to um, to be transparent about where things are. So for me, it's about vehemently protecting the small hours of the day that I do. Them, trying to shift. Our team is also very global, so my mornings are all Europe, my nights are Asia, and that's very hard. So I'm the first to say I'm, I'm, I'm still learning, but I think asking for help, being honest about it, and understanding that things ebb and flow as well, and to be selfish about sending boundaries, I'm extremely uh, much more efficient than I ever was before, and uh, We'll see. But if, if any of you uh, working moms out there have advice for them, all of including Monica, who's given me great advice. <laughs> um, yeah, I have, I have two of my own, and I love that you're throwing the word balance out the window because it simply doesn't exist. Not just for, for parents, um, but, you know, I think for people who, like all of you in the audience, um, you know, want to accomplish great things in your lifetime. So it's about integration and, uh, and holding that integration uh, with sanity and perspective. <laughs> well, you, you've done a really great job, and I, I think I do on that. And I think it's also, someone told me, just give yourself a lot of grace, generosity, understand that it's okay that I haven't worked out in two years, for example. Yeah, it'll come back. You look great. <laughs> great, so um, let's open it up for audience questions. Um, we have a few minutes, I'm not sure where, um, Three is, but here's the microphone, and just raise your hand, and I'll uh, try to spot you. Mine is a really quick question. Uh, when you talked about the percentage of female founders, 
Can you speak a little bit more about the center and where it stands? Not just in terms of female, but in terms of just numbers. About which, about? Uh, this center. Uh, the San Francisco Center, how many female founders you have, what's the level of diversity, what's, you know. Oh, this I think that's effort. the question for Shiri. Oh, okay. So Shiri, the question is, um, this is called Launchpad Space, uh, which is housing this event, and the question is, what's the percentage of female founders that, that 33% right now, yeah. Uh, we make an effort to reach out to different community groups, so anything from uh, expat women to uh, Persian women in tech and girls who code, women who code, like uh, different types of groups just so we can have more of uh, you know, women in the audience. And that's why I'm always you know, very moved and, and excited to see so many women in the audience. And yeah, so that's why we're doing this as well. Great, so a question here, and then there's one in the back, and then one here. So, are you off for a catch <laughs> no. okay. um, this thing, Hello, sir. Uh, if my question has been addressed in your talk earlier, uh, then we can skip it because I know a lot of people have to ask questions. I will stand the next way, but maybe I can find out later. Okay, go ahead and ask. Um, so, in order to be part of the launch pad and come here in the accelerator, does the startup have to use Google products? Excellent question. The question was, do startups need to use Google products to be part of Launchpad, Accelerator, or any of our programs? And the answer, 100% across the board is no. We do not require that whatsoever. In fact, we find it valuable when people do not use our products because we want to understand why. And it's perfectly fine that you, that you don't. But what are the things that would ease the barrier or make it more appealing to you? So, absolutely not. But we do find that many of them do use Google products. So, then what is the criteria In terms of for Google for entrepreneurs or launch uh, I don't know the difference. <laughs> yeah, so we have a variety of programs across Google, including within Google for entrepreneurs and across the company. Launchpad is a fantastic example of a great program. Each of them have different criteria. So I would say uh, start up with Google. Startup.google.com is a great place to learn about all these resources. We link out to all the programs. Ours is google.com slash entrepreneurs. You can find the Google for entrepreneurs specific things. But it really does vary by the type of program. For example, within Canvas, we run residency. It's for sort of earlier stage companies who are getting raised to raise a Series A. And we have demo days where companies are actively raising a Series A. So we try to address actually all stages in the pipeline, but each program criteria does vary. Um, great, thanks. So I know you have the microphone. There's a question way in the back ahead of you, and then I'll come back to you if that's okay. So way in the back. Um, yeah, can you step forward? I'm, I'm trying to sort of go in order. Yeah, you can throw them. Yeah. If you're comfortable. No one's trying. It doesn't it's hurt. It's really fun. I know. I know. I have another mic also for the front. Go ahead. First of all, thank you very much for your time. And congratulations on your career. It's always amazing to see a woman and international being successful and in
one of the top pieces of feedback I hear from startups is the business development partnership sales. Founders usually tell me the number one thing I wish I could have told my, my previous, my younger self was don't underestimate the importance of revenue. Right? So the business that can go to market is critical. So I think those are some of the things I would prioritize, but I would not, you know, please do not limit yourself. Definitely apply for these programs, get in, that's how you're going to meet more founders as well, get more access. Thank you. Over here and then up in the front. If you can bring that microphone up front so that. Hi, my name is Moria, and I heard about this event from Startup East Bay, that's at Cal State East Bay, actually, so thank you for your part. And I see the tremendous uh, creations that uh, our Cal State East Bay students are creating and ideas that they're launching along with their mentors. So I, I salute you to that, and I, I'm, I'm here to learn more about everybody else's stories and how it is um, to promote tech and to promote entrepreneurship in general, to, to bring, um, to inspire more women and more Southeast Asian women. Um, coming from Indonesia, being an immigrant, uh, your story relates so close to my heart and congratulations to your new role as well. Um, but I would like to know if you have any encouraging uh, or some tips and ideas in terms of mentorship and how to um, create more avenues for young women um, in, in, in creating to inspire them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that feedback and comments and also the question. I think it's really mentorship super super important. It's been a huge role in my own personal life as well. And the important thing to remember, well one I'll speak to the community as well. So I would say coming to events like this, joining the ups, I know women tech makers is a program right out of this group that is amazing. We don't have to think of just women's groups and prop trades, we're gonna be having women working together. So one of the top things that I love is Startup Grind chapter meetups. There are like 400 cities around the world. Find them. Startup Grind is a free monthly meetup. We do a fireside chat with the people who can meet. So finding your tribe, right, the men and women who are interested in this space is maybe to start going to them, we can join normally. On the mentorship front, I think there's two ways to approach it. One is informal, the second is formal. So informally, most relationships develop organically. And the people who have been my number one advocates, people I've worked up to the most, none of them have ever informal mentors, right? It's sort of like meet them, you follow up with them, maybe you try to be helpful to them in some way as well. So definitely ask, push the boundaries. The worst that someone says is no, and so that people want. So I find a lot of times, for myself as well, a, a shyness of, well, who am I to approach that person when they really want to help me? You'd be surprised. And honestly, the worst that happens is you would want to ask someone else. Secondly, I think there's formal programs that you can look at as well, different um, organizations within your, your community. Or if you run a business, if you run a company, think about structuring something. Something we just rolled out on our team this year is a mentorship program. We work a lot with startups to try to get them mentors, but we actually send anyone on our team who wants to be formally mentored, raise your hand, tell us what you're interested in. And then I went out and found 30 mentors from our own personal community, senior people, and asked them personally, will you do this? And we structured a program where we get together once a quarter, and then offline if we need as much as we want to. So thinking about it as the founder, as the employer, as the CEO of your company, what can you do to get your team involved? I would say, the number one thing is don't be shy, put it out there, go for it, we have to support each other, we have to be honest about what works, what doesn't work, what the struggles are, and don't, if I can say one thing, don't have that sense of imposter syndrome. Right? Why do I? And I have that gift. Do I deserve this opportunity? Who am I to have this? Who am I to say this? But really, you are powerful and have the right attitude. I think this is going to do so much good. Okay, thank you. So I had one question in the front, and I think we have time for one more. I saw your hand go up first. Um, so we'll take these last two questions. First of all, thank you for this wonderful space. I was wondering who was responsible for this. I know it's, I've already thanked her, but there's some magic I think coming from you too. One girl, one girl. Yeah, one girl. About the skyscraper <laughs> and about the seeds and this whole like Google over here. We're going to talk about that later. Really a big picture thing. But have you guys thought about making a movie about the. Uh, have you ever written a movie about the computer? What do you guys do? <laughs> 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 you know, it's a movie called The Internship. <laughs> 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 
there are video vignettes on the website if you go that sort of piece together uh, stories that, that Mary was uh, talking about globally. So. Exactly. So it's a great point. Of one of the things I'm really eager to do is to capture the voices of entrepreneurs who work with Google or actually on the ground in Google. So we've acquired a lot of companies over the years, for example. So I see our our team's mission is is to be capturing those amplifying stories. So look for more to come. We're really interested in next year, not probably in the form of a of a film. But I think uh, one of my dreams would be to have a podcast series that we do that features founders, entrepreneurs, voices, perspectives, or so much knowledge that we want to share from others we work with. All right, last question. Okay, so that's a kind Make of no bullshit question for you. Um, so I think one of the things that we hear a lot is women entrepreneurs. We know the reality, right? Like two and a half percent, three percent of people fund their women. We know that most of them are actually not even diverse. Women. And so when I go out and I talk to people and I'm like, look, I have this concept, I'm working on it, I found a team, they're all half time, I'm trying to get them on full time, I need to raise money. The number one thing I get is like, well, you have to make revenue, you have to have the product, and it all has to be built up, a billion, a gazillion people should be using it. And then I go talk to other entrepreneurs who actually raise that money early and I say to them, guys, how did you do it? Like, how did you raise that first time in my case? And I hear over and over again, well, it was just my debt. I had one one investor tell me just straight up. She said, "I really hope you have great family." And and like, I, and I'm telling you, I hear this all the time. And so I think the the one question I have for you guys is like, what advice do you have for us? Where if we're in the early days, we kind of figure it out, so we kind of get that first milestone met, and we're not necessarily in the world ready to go get raise millions of dollars. And, and what is Google doing? And it's all well, the target market. Um, around that stuff, or what advice do you give us? Excellent, very complex um, conversation. <laughs> it's, it's abysmal, it's a, it's a really challenging environment. One thing I will say to preface is I really believe we're living in an extremely opportunistic moment for women. For better or worse, the tech press is spotlight red hot on this issue. Let's see some moment. Whether it's for the right reason or the wrong reason, VCs and others are under a lot of pressure right now. Let's see that moment, right? Literally, it's actually a benefit in many ways to be a right now, and that's what we'll see that to our advantage. I think on the actual issue, I completely uh, empathize, and I'm not surprised to hear you guys are appalled and sad to I'm not surprised. I think that we still live in a world that's very much a world based it's a relationship business, and so my number one thing that we believe is it's not about creating separate networks for women, but it's about integrating women into all the networks that exist. So more and more, we see that you know, we are paying attention, because maybe for the right reason, maybe for the wrong reason, nonetheless, we're paying attention. It's figuring out how to go to these events, how to get introduced, how to get on the radar. Because their goal is to expand the pipeline of companies they see. It's not a big, you know, not they are just not investing, they're not seeing the right number in order to make those investments. So how do we get you on the radar? So how can these events ask us for help? Let's get the fish that's in there, go to pitch conversations, even if it's not 100% ready for five times. On the raising millions and billions of dollars, I think the early stage capital is going to be the most critical. So that's going to be friends and family. I would recommend friends and family, angel investment. I don't know what the nature of the product is. It's a physical product, is it a product? I mean, even just get a proof of concept, it's good enough to actually prove it. But before you're ready to raise institutional money, then I advise founders, don't give up any of your company until you really have to, right? It's impossible to do it through your smaller infusions of capital to prove it, all the better. So, so please come with come that piece of that and let's continue to push to get into the existing network rather than create a silent network. Yeah, and uh, just, to, just to add, in politics we used to say, never waste a crisis. <laughs> and um, if you haven't been listening to the news, uh, let me just tell you, we are in a crisis, women. So, don't waste it. <laughs> Uh, there's another group that I would just would recommend Astia. If you're not involved, Astia Angels. They're early stage. They're a nonprofit. A S T I A. They're a nonprofit focused on connecting female founders with early stage access to capital. They have a whole portfolio. They have a whole education series. On the flip side, they're trying to train new angel investors, accredited you know individuals who don't know how to invest but want to. So figuring out groups like Astia and other like yeah, the one other that I would add to that is called SheEO. If you haven't heard about it, um, it's a wonderful concept for um, investing in women, and it is um, 
more sort of crowdfunding, micro-lending uh, concept, but um, it really has a lot of traction, and, um, and I've seen some success. I uh, was recently at an event there. Um, Golden Heights. It's called She E O, and I'm sure many of you have uh, other examples. Um, capital S H E. Yeah, E O. Yeah, She E O. So we're gonna have to um, wrap up. Mary, I want to thank you thank so you. much. It was such a delight to be here. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to hand it over to Aisha, since it's also about the next short break.